Welcome to another Napa Institute webcast. Our guest today is David Scott. David is one of the most accomplished and versatile lay figures on the American Catholic scene. A graduate of Boston University and Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, he's the author of multiple books and numerous articles. In National Review, L'Observatorio Romano, Commonweal, Crisis, U.S. Catholic and other national and international outlets. Over the years, he's served as editor of our Sunday Visitor National News Weekly, editorial director of the St. Paul's Center for Biblical Theology in Steubenville, Ohio, and editor-in-chief of Catholic News Service, EWTN News. He's also provided invisible but invaluable research and staff support to a wide variety of bishops and lay Catholic leaders, and now serves as vice chancellor for communications and an aide, senior aide, to Archbishop Jose Gomez of Los Angeles. Dave, thanks for being here today. Great to be here. Thanks. We've been friends for a very long time. It's great to be able to be uh, to, to talk this way instead of okay. conspiring together. <laughs> <laughs> great uh, to be here. Dave, you know, 40 years ago, one of my mentors uh, told me, this is back when dinosaurs walked the earth, mm -hmm. that um, what the church really, need for re really needs for renewal are a few really brilliant utility infielders, mm -hmm. men and women who can do a variety of important jobs mm -hmm. and do them really well. He meant that as a high compliment, and that kind of sums up your career. Uh, the question is, why did you choose to serve the church, and, mm -hmm. um, and what led you to write? Well, I guess the first thing to say is that having you a really good utility infielder for the church on my headstone would be a great thing. <laughs> um, but no, it is a good compliment. Um, how I how I got here, it, it's uh, how I got here is one 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 name, uh, John Paul II. He he, um, uh, I was living in D.C. in the '80s, uh, early '80s. Uh, had a good job as a reporter covering politics. Um, the was in a used bookstore and found a copy of his encyclical. Um, a Redeemer of Man, and it was um, yeah, that's a great one. nothing short of life-changing, right? I mean, Christ has the answer to every question in every human heart. He has the answer to the Cold War. He has the answer to the, the problems of politics. I mean, I'd never seen the faith presented in that way. Uh, and that really an became the blueprint for his entire pontificate. Everything flows from that. Everything, everything. And and whether, you know, I'm sure he wasn't thinking about me, but it changed my life. Uh, I, I was newly married. I went home. I, uh, over the next year, my wife and I made plans to leave D.C. I went back to seminary. Um, I, I got a master's degree in scripture and theology. And, and by the time I was done with that, we were expecting our first child. I uh, needed a job, so... <laughs> <laughs> answered a one ad and be and entered into uh, I got a job at a Catholic newspaper and that's yeah. how it started uh, that was where where was that Albany, Albany New, York. New York right yeah 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 and uh, but I was blessed great mentors I mean there it was a, I don't think I don't think we remember how much John Paul changed the whole conversation yeah. I mean we were all suddenly we're all looking at at the world as Catholics with with this kind of confidence and this ability to to say hey you know the church has answers here and um, so I, I was blessed I had great mentors I had a, a my, my first editor was a guy named Jim Bragg and he he just told me everything everything is Catholic so so it, whether it's the local economy or world affairs yeah. and Along the way, I met met you. I, you were doing amazing things at that time. I mean, it, so it was just this exciting time. I got to cover, you know, the first Gulf War, <laughs> welfare reform, abortion, nuclear disarmament talks. I mean, this was fun yeah, stuff. It's a, it's a comprehensive way of looking at the world. Yeah, exactly. That, I That's mean, it doesn't exactly have all the specific answers, but it has all of the framework for those answers if you if you think deeply enough about the faith. Yeah, yeah, and I, I was just blessed to have people who were holier and smarter than me to show me how to start thinking that way. So it, it's been a blessing. Great. Yeah, well, a blessing for the church, too, by the way. Well, but, but uh, Dave, you've written book. I mean, you've written all sorts of things during your career, but I'm thinking of the books that you've written about Dorothy Day, Mother Teresa, and Father John Hugo. Hugo is probably the least well-known, mm -hmm. but um, why those three? What, what appealed to them? Uh, what appealed to you about them, and, and why would they be important for Catholics now? 
Yeah, that's a good question. The, you know, um, I, I, had the, I did the Father Hugo book with, with Mike Aquilina, one of the great church yeah, historians. Yeah, Mike's and, great. Uh, patristic scholars, um, but we gave it the title Living a Holy Life in Unholy Times, and in a way that that's the Christian challenge, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it covers all those books, really, um, you know, and in their own way. I, I didn't plan this out, but, you know, there was a priest, Dorothy Day, a layperson, Mother Teresa, a religious, but in all three of those vocations, they were all showing us how to live a holy life in unholy times. Mm -hmm. um, they also, um, again, not with any plan, they were also all children of, of St. Therese of Lisieux. So, so they, the, li the little that. way, yeah. you know. Uh, so every one of them in their own way was teaching us to, to do every little thing with great love and do it for Jesus and that by those little actions you actually change the world. Yeah, it's so. interesting because uh, that resonates with uh, something Augustine said, uh, to be faithful in little things is a big thing. Yeah, right, you know? right. So uh, whole, how to be holy in unholy times is an extremely relevant topic right now. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Not just in the world in general, but very specifically in the United States. But you've had an, a long-term interest in biblical theology and the church fathers, and mm -hmm. being interested in the Bible is you know, kind of obvious. It's the beginning of everything, the Word of God. But uh, why the Church Fathers? I mean, the Church Fathers lived a very long time ago, 1,600 years ago, mm -hmm. give or take a century. And um, a lot of people are unfamiliar with them. I mean, why your focus on the Church Fathers? They, you know, the, the first thing people don't know about the Church Fathers is everything they ever wrote was a reflection on Scripture. Mm -hmm. You know, Augustine didn't sit down and write the City of God without yeah. the Gospel in his hands. A and and in little ways and big ways, they were all reflecting on the Word of God. So, so, so they had a sense that 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 the Word of God had the answer to our to our challenges. Um, why they're still relevant is, you know, because human nature hasn't changed. And and I don't know about you, but the pre-Christian world looks a heck of a lot like the post-Christian world. Mm -hmm. You know, we have idols, we have false paths of happiness, and. We have all sorts of slaveries and addictions and, and things. And so if we're going to convert this world, those guys can show us a lot. Um, and and I think I think the, the main thing they show us is the meaning of the human person, mm -hmm. which gets us back to John Paul. Um, and I think I, I came to the Church Fathers through people like de Lubach and, and yeah. people like Ratzinger who, who were able to really show us you know, how, they, how they are related. To, to what we're doing today. You said just a moment ago that uh, the pre-Christian and the post-Christian world have a lot of similarities in terms of the tendency toward idolatry, basically. Absolutely. But um, you're probably familiar with C.S. Lewis's famous uh, lecture at Cambridge. I think it was, mm -hmm. has a Latin name, De Descriptione um, Temporum, and it's about the division of time into ages. One of the points he makes in there is that Christians actually, first of all, he confirms what you just said, that there are enormous similarities between pre- and post-Christian, but there are also some significant differences in the sense that um, Christians and pagans worshipped unseen God, mm -hmm. unseen gods, whereas the modern age is really much more aggressively materialist than its okay. godlings, you know, and that, that is really a, a significant difference. Uh, and one of, the fun <laughs> one of the driving factors in that, obviously, is technology. I mean, uh, you and I were formed in print culture. Most yeah. Catholics, the church was, you know, print culture is the language of the church for the last, you know, hundreds of years. Um, Technology has turned that all on its head, and I'm wondering, uh, in your experience, has the church really absorbed the lessons of that change yet, and is she doing the right things to kind of begin evangelizing that territory? Yeah, I guess the... the uh yeah, you know, the church has always used the technologies, right? From from radio yeah. to print. Um, the the temptation of the digital thing. I, I think we. I I think I'm blessed right now in Los Angeles. We have. I I, I dare say we have the best um, use of digital media in the U.S. Church. I yeah. um, I would agree. I'm, with that. I'm open to disagreement on it, but that, that's not the point. The point is, 
we're also very wary of how you use it. It's a means, it's not an end. And, and I think what, what I'm worried about with what we did in COVID is we, we started to look at the technology as an end in itself. Mm -hmm. You know, like, okay, we can have digital mass, but um, everything has to lead us to the encounter with Christ. And that's, that's something that happens between two people. It happens in groups. It doesn't happen. It's incarnate. It doesn't happen with me on my couch, right, yeah. right. And, and so the temptation is there. The other thing I think the, uh, I think the church needs to lead the way uh, in creating kind of a 12-step a program for getting us off our screens mm -hmm. because the faith is it. I think we don't realize how much these, this technology is robbing us of contemplation, robbing us of silence. Um, in the end, God's going to speak to my heart, but if I can't hear him, uh, it doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, basically, uh, uh, the new technologies have abolished distance and also silence. Yeah, you know? yeah. And the distance with, you know, between you and the outside world. There's no, there's, uh, we're, we're constantly being invaded. So, so I think, I, I don't want to get to an anti-technology mode, but we have to keep it in its proper place. And right. I think we, we're in a... I don't think the church has done a good enough job of assessing, you know, we don't want to be the people who, who are Luddites or dumping on technology, mm -hmm. but we've got to really look at it critically. Yeah. The, the, uh, what's this done to Catholic publishing? I mean, you're, a, you're an editor, you're a word mm -hmm. man, uh, and much of your career was writing articles and editing other people in Catholic publishing. I mean, the, the habits of Catholic publishing seem to have really been blown up by a lot of right. modern technology. Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of what's happened to Catholic journalism, you and I were both trained classically as journalists, mm -hmm. but everything, everything about journalism in general has changed, and that's had the same effect on Catholic publishing. Uh, things tend to be more opinionated, you want a hot take, you want, you, you know, there's not there's not that time for a short hot take. Yeah, short <laughs> hot take, exactly. And and um, and 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 we're not very, we're not terribly patient. We're not terribly kind. Um, those things are all bad. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, in in terms of, in in terms of the printed word, it's a hard time for it. I still engage in a printed word, but what do you? Uh, the audience is used to. To the digital. Yeah, world. I still read the Wall Street Journal, and I read it in print form. I don't. Right. I don't really like the digital form. I like having the access to the digital form, um, because it's a great way to archive things. But yeah. but uh, it, physically, it's just a different kind of a feel to the experience of absorbing information. And I also wonder. Um, you, you deal with this every day. I mean, the new technologies also affect the eyes. Mm -hmm. And the and the um, the senses behind the eyes, just because the electrons are constantly moving, you know. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the other thing about the digital, and again, I'm open to the fact that I'm old, and my kids may be. <laughs> maybe, if you're old, uh, I'm a lot older. But. Well, uh, and my and my kids may be experiencing it differently, but I don't read the same when I read on a screen. Yeah. And, and if we're getting most of our information on a screen, for me, that means. I'm scanning. I'm, I'm acquiring. Well, what's it's T. S. Eliot, right? What what is the amount of wisdom that's lost in information? Mm -hmm. right? So, I have lots of information. Am I any wiser? Don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think information is inversely proportional to wisdom. <laughs> 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 yes. You know, um, but but this raises another question, which is uh, the side effects of digital technology. I mean, you 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 run communications for. As you said, it's, it's true. You're in California, you're in Los Angeles, media capital of the United States, really, in many ways. Um, and certainly in entertainment, uh, uh, it easily outstrips New York. Uh, what's it doing to people's heads and imaginations? I mean, when you, where I'm going with this is, uh, you and I have a strong sense of the supernatural, mm -hmm. and our imaginations were formed mm -hmm. by print. Um, as you just indicated, that's no longer the case. And uh, I'm wondering if part of the, rece the recession in people's minds of the reality of the supernatural mm -hmm. is being replaced by things like virtual reality where you can yeah. basically create your own other world without having to believe all that 
stuff about Dante and you know on. Right, right. It's it's probably even more perverse than than we can think about. But but you're right. I mean, there's there's a you know our our whole society is oriented towards denying us transcendence. So and the technology in a sense replaces it. So I don't think the human need for transcendence goes away. We just find different ways to replace it. I mean, you you, you know you're talking about it in a very generic sense of how. The technology itself works now. Get into things like you know um, the gaming, get into pornography, all these other ways where where it is it is changing how we how we interact. Yeah, you know, I you and I have talked about this before, but it, Steam is one of the big game websites on the web, and it's it's run by a company called Valve. It's a uh, a very mainstream computer gaming company, and most of the games are are. You know, many of them are interesting. I've been a gamer a long time, as we've yeah. talked about um, previously. But the number of <laughs> amazingly vivid and intense virtual reality sex games that anybody can get off of those websites is just, is, it's really quite extraordinary. And that, I mean, that's not good news on all sorts of range. No, and it's ways. hard to talk about, so we don't tend to talk about mm -hmm. it, but it's not good. I mean, it's not uh, where. This generation is, uh, you can link it to all these other social problems. Yeah, it doesn't take a, it doesn't take a brainiac to figure out that a ga that game with the name <laughs> VR Sin Island <laughs> is not going to be, you know, uh, a religious experience. But there's, but there is, uh, you know, that's really, um, that sort of thing is now extremely common. And, yeah. and uh, it's affecting the sexual behavior, uh, the mental patterns, I mean, um, it's really, it really is a new evangelization that's required for that sort of thing. Is there anybody in the church, I may have asked this question previously, but can you point to anybody in the church who's doing good, deep thinking about these issues? Short answer is probably no, which doesn't mean that thinking hasn't been doing, yeah. isn't being done. But I think, you know, you, you, you go back to people, the, the clues are all there in people like Del Noche and, mm -hmm. and the other people we, we talk about. But, but it seems like a gen, I, um, I think it's very easy to get caught up in the specifics of things, kind of like the, we just got in, you know, a, a conversation about the specifics. So it's very harder to, to pull back and say, what is this technology doing to how we think, how we how we order our lives and our and our thought process. Um, that I think is harder to do. And and some of that, the best people who are doing it, were doing it 50 or 60 years ago. So I think we have to return to those people. You've lived in and worked in both the eastern and the western United States, um, for the church in both mm. places. I mean, what what's the difference in the experience? I mean, in terms of Catholic life in say a place like. Um, Indiana or, or Pennsylvania, where you were yeah. based for a long time, and now you're in Los Angeles. Well, the the short answer is it's probably it's it's an older church back east and it's younger church here mm -hmm. that doesn't carry through. Um, here, the uh, L A is the the West Coast is so over, you know the the immigrant experience is so overwhelming. It's hard to it's it's true also like we say mass in forty different languages in L A. and yeah. the uh, that's true in Chicago and New York and um, but not other places. But um, I think the the one statistic. I don't think it's even that uh, extensive in those other places, in, in New York and Chicago, as it is in Los Angeles. I yeah. mean, I, it, it's really quite astonishing the number of different immigrant groups you have here. Yeah, and it's it's a function of geography, right? We're at the crossroads of yeah. uh, you know north, south, east, and west, and and so, but um, that that has its own challenges. Um, the the, but I guess the mission for the church is still the same, right? We. Now, one statistic my boss likes to use is, is uh, Archbishop Gomez, is he'll, he'll say that, you know, the way we measure demography in the church is by infant baptisms. Mm -hmm. So if you say the number of infant baptisms in Los Angeles, even though they're declining like they are everywhere else, in a given year, we baptize more people in Los Angeles than New York, Chicago, Boston, and Philadelphia combined. Wow. Like, so not, not individually, just so that's mm -hmm. that tells you where the growth is, but it also tells you um, 
you know, if, if, the, if we allow these people who are these young people to be assimilated into this culture, we lose them again. And the assimilation rates to becoming more American than Catholic um, is happening quicker with this generation than it did with earlier generations. So that's the challenge, I think. You and I have both worked for senior American bishops, uh, and we both staffed those bishops at synods in Rome. What's your, to people outside the kind of work that we do or have done, I mean, what do you find in the life of a bishop that is the least understood by the, by the people that he leads? <laughs> so that's a very good question. The, um, and also, what does he most need from his people? Yeah. The, you know, there's that line from St. Paul, um, you know, I have anxiety for the churches. He's talking about, you know, every day getting up and worrying about the churches he founded and the people mm -hmm. there. I, I, I guess my, my perception from the out is, is that, that that's a bishop's burden every day. You know, he's, he, he knows he's been given a lot of people. My, the Archbishop of Los Angeles is responsible for five million souls, so that's a huge amount of uh, responsibility and accountability before God. Um, I, th I think, uh, I mean, I'd be interesting to know what you think the challenge is because I, I think the biggest challenge for them is to not be CEOs and to be pastors and yeah. shepherds. And, and, and it's not so easy to divide that, right? Because they are, you know, the Archbishop of Los Angeles is responsible for a corporation that's got 22,000 employees, about 300 points of presence in the community. You count parishes, you count schools, more, more double that. And so, so it's not so easy. He is responsible for payroll, HR, but also he's responsible for spiritually leading. So that's, and that's every bishop's challenge, whether it's, it's different scale where we are, but um, I, I don't know. That's, that's I mean, the thing that I marvel at is, is, the, is the way that um, so many of these men actually stick with it, yeah. sometimes for decades. I mean, yeah. it's not an easy job. And the emotional, you know, the, inter, the, the bishops that I, I interviewed over the last three or four months on a project that I'm working on all were men pretty well grounded and, and actually quite hopeful. Yeah. And I'm baffled how that is, <laughs> I'm baffled how that's possible. I mean, the best bishops are the guys who didn't want it, right? They, yeah. they, they were, you know, they, they wanted to be priests. They and who have a life of, an active life of prayer. Right, right. And, and, and still the best bishops are the ones who can maintain that. I, I, but I think it's not easy. I don't think we pray for our bishops enough. I think it's, we probably send them all the wrong emails. Oh, know? yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you well, know. you and I have both seen some of those emails. My goodness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, charity is not there often. <laughs> Yeah, that, that left the building. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anything else in terms of um, what you've observed over the years in terms of just how diocesan life works? I, th I think they, I, yeah, at its, at its best, we, we all remember that, uh, that we're here to bring souls to Jesus and to, um, and, but, but at our at our best as fathers and husbands and you know that's our vocation mm -hmm. too. But um, but but it it is it is it is always hard to overcome the bureaucratic part of the church, and, mm -hmm. and that's that's probably the least satisfying. I'm sure it was the least satisfying for yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Um, which leads me to my next question. I mean, that there are a lot of people who, looking from the outside, see the idea of. Well, you know, I'll retire, or I'll make my life, uh, my life's work working in a diocesan bureaucracy. Um, that tends to work out a little more complicated than <laughs> people first imagine. I mean, what are the skills? First of all, what are the frustrations of working in a diocesan chancery? I mean, you, you you've kind of touched on that, and they're fairly obvious. Uh, but what are the special skills that make somebody effective in that role? The, uh, Lay the, staff and a yeah, basically I mean, clerical. I, I, I guess if I can make the presumption that I'm somehow effective, <laughs> well, you still got a there. job. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but um, I, I think for for me, the the biggest thing that that you want in the chancery, and the one thing I want to struggle with every day is humility, mm -hmm. so that you can you can. <sighs> 
so you can stay in the background. If, if you want to, uh, the, the most effective people I see and uh, are the people who don't want to be players. They don't want to know. Nobody knows who I am, mm -hmm. but I, I'm able to, so that gives me the kind of freedom to do things as long as I don't wake up some morning and say, I'm the Archbishop of Los Angeles yeah. or, or presume to have some kind of uh, um, authority that I don't. I, I just, so, so you, humility and the desire to serve, um, yeah. I think those are, those are things I'm always trying to have. Um, and then, of course, the, you know, the prayer life, you know, if you, if you, uh, if you don't pray hard, if you don't have a devotion to Our Lady, um, th the human element of the church can wash over you really quick and you can say, what is this all about? So. Yeah, you know, the, while you were talking, I was thinking, the people who know what you do know who you are, you know, but to, but to the general public, um, people in your kind of a position are invisible, and it's best to be invisible. I did an interview yeah. earlier today with a human rights activist in, uh, in Britain, and one of the comments he made, it's been made by a lot of different people, but you can accomplish a great deal if you don't need the credit. Yeah, you know, absolutely. The, if you're willing to live with invisibility, and I think a lot of that applies to uh, the lay vocation in general, actually mm -hmm. all of life. If you're willing to work hard, get things done, you can get a lot done if you don't also have your ego in, in, a, in first gear to get the, you know, yeah. to get the credit for it, um, and that's very very hard for people. Yeah, it's and true. it's a it's a great compliment to you that you do it so well. Actually, um, what are you going to do um, in the years ahead? I mean, obviously you're committed to Archbishop Jose until his, until he's going to be retiring, but I mean, long term, how do you how do you see your lay vocation? How would you describe it to somebody on the outside? Well, you know, the the church work is great. It's beautiful. It's it's um, uh, it's 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 a blessing to get up in the morning. I mean, I, I've had 30, 35 years now where I, I have not had to worry about somebody else's bottom line, all the, all the pressures that other people have. I get up every morning and if I do it right, I'm working for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's an amazing blessing. Um, uh, that said, my, 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 my primary vocation as a lay person is to be a good dad, a good grandfather, a good father, and a good brother, a good son. That's the heart of the, the key question here at the, toward the end of our, our conversation. I mean. If you had to describe the, the key elements of an effective lay vocation, what would those elements be? Not just yours, not the one you're yeah, doing, yeah. but all lay vocation. What it is all, it? It all starts with 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 Christ, knowing knowing Him and 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 want and and really believing that that he died for me and I got to live for him and that means all these different things and it means living like him in that sense in the sense of sacrifice and and putting aside some of the things I might want or or that um, that's the starting point everything else for me flows from that yeah. and that can be applied in all sorts of different positions and jobs and, and professions Ab absolutely right you know, it's kind of a basic all-purpose principle right. yeah so, so it may not say that much, but that's that is that is how I I kind of, I kind of try to order my day. Last question: the, um, you're in a unique position to see everything that's going wrong. Okay, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, it's <clears throat> the temptation is to become very negative, um, which of course goes back to Voitiwa's comment at the beginning. Fear not, you know. I mean, right. your commitment to Carol Wojtyla and John Paul II, obviously, was that this guy gives you yes. this enormous spirit of energy and and hope and, po and and positive action. In today's environment, when you wake up and you look out at the world, knowing everything you know, working for a diocese, having a close look at at, at a very effective bishop and a leader in the American Church, I mean, what what gives you hope? Um. It's we were both at a at an event the other night with these young people. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's they're in their young people now are in their twenties and thirties, <laughs> and the end of thirties. But I mean, when you're my age, forties is those, young. those people are <laughs> those. Uh, I mean, what hope, right? I mean, yeah. those those guys they they know their faith. They're at the top of their fields there, and they they 
and they they want to live their faith at the top of their fields they're yeah. not working for the church like me they're you know they're running companies they're psychologists they're attorneys i mean it, that that's amazing um the other thing that gives me hope is just you know it's easter time and and uh the resurrection the victory is won um i i, I have to keep that in front of my mind because i do tend yeah. to have that dark personality that but the uh, that's the victory the victory is won and and we got to keep I, I still have to get my my kids and my grandkids to heaven mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, that's a big that's, responsibility. That's, that's but, you know, the other thing that gives me hope is, is the reality of Christian friendship. I mean, when you're really in the dumps or you have um, pressures that get you down, I mean, <clears throat> the fact that Christianity is so profoundly a network of friends, beginning with the words of Jesus himself to his apostles, now I call you friends, that, that gift of friendship is the thing that sustains people across generations and, and throughout some very difficult times in the church and we never lose that if we really take our faith seriously yeah I'm sure that's been your experience I mean particularly oh. you moved all over the country yeah you've yeah. always had a network of friends yeah and 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 the best kind of people too I yeah mean, people who will sacrifice for you tell you what you when you're being a jerk and and uh, really hold you accountable and, mm -hmm. and and help you move forward yeah Present company, excluded, yeah, because exactly. we're not jerks, right? <laughs> exactly. David, it's been wonderful talking to you. Yeah, thanks, and I, I, I admire you so very much, and um, really, thanks for being here today. Thanks. Thanks for being with us uh, on this webcast, and uh, please pray for the Napa Institute. Uh, pray for Dave and his work, which is very important for the life of the church, and have a wonderful day. God bless you.